Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Tony Brew Ministries, welcoming you for the following Bible teaching session entitled God's Love and Judgment. People usually present God as either one or the other. Either He's a God of love or He's a God of judgment. But God is both a God of love and judgment. God's love expresses His mercy. God's judgment expresses His righteousness. God's judgment is governed by His love and mercy. The thing that keeps God's judgment from blazing out of control, if you will, as far as we're concerned, is His love and mercy. Mercy rejoices against judgment. James tells us that. Judgment is necessary because sin has to be paid for, accounted for, And either our sin is paid for by Jesus Christ, which it is. He paid for the sin of the whole world. But either that is accounted for because we have put our faith and trust in Him, or when we reject Christ, we have to account for our own sins. We have to suffer and be punished for our own sins. Our golden text verse, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all His ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is He. This expresses God in His judgment and also His righteousness. And He is right, perfect, and complete in everything that He does. God is merciful and loving. Psalm 86, verse 15 and 16. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. This is a wonderful expression of the God that we serve. He's a loving God. He's full of compassion. He is a long-suffering God. In the world that we live in today and all that's going on, we can certainly agree and see that God is a long-suffering God. He certainly puts up with a lot of mess that's going on in our world today. He is a God of truth. He is a God of righteousness. The psalmist cries out, O turn unto me and have mercy upon me. Give thy strength unto thy servant and save the son of thine handmaid. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. It's a grand classic scripture that tells us about God's love and mercy. But God, and that's one of those but gods, isn't it? But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. That's a power-packed punch scripture right there, because it talks to us about God's love and mercy. He's rich in love and mercy. It also talks to us about being quickened together with Christ. We are brought to life together with Christ. When He raised spiritually, we raised because we now identify with Him. He has quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 10. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. To be identified with love, you have to be identified with God. To be identified with God is to be identified with love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is how we see and know the love of God. This is how the love of God is manifested, because God sent His Son into the world, that we might have life and live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, the atonement, the mercy seat for our sins. God is a loving and merciful God. Have mercy upon me, That's what the blind man said. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. 
David himself, the psalmist, said, Lord, have mercy upon me and heal me. When he committed that awful sin, he said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Be merciful unto me, O Lord. Cast me not away from your presence. God is a merciful and loving and forgiving God. And no matter what kind of message you hear today, and I'll say today, but you can identify with this day, no matter what kind of message you've heard, it says God is a mean old God. I want you to know that God is a loving God. Yes, God is angry. He is wrathful against sin, and He has to punish sin. But He's also a loving God. He would rather bless you than bug you any time. He would rather hug you than hate you, and God doesn't hate, of course, but His hatred is against sin. He would rather save you and bless you and redeem you than to judge you any time. God is a loving and merciful God, but He's also a righteous God. God's righteousness and perfect, that is complete, unadulterated judgment. In Exodus chapter 20, one of the commandments, verses 4 through 6, has to do with idols, graven images. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. God did not want His people to identify with images and physical things. He wanted them to enjoy the physical things of His creation. But He did not want them to worship them, to identify with them. He wanted them to worship Him, and He wants us to worship Him. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. That's what the Hebrew boys told Nebuchadnezzar. Nebi, we know you're the king. But we're not afraid to answer you in this matter. Be it known to you, our God's able to deliver us. But even if He does not, we will not bow down to your image, and we will not serve the gods that you made. We will not serve this image that you've set up. God delivered them from the fire in the fiery furnace, and He'll deliver you and I today. Even if we have to give our life for the cause of Christ, we're still suffering and we're still dying in the right way because we're dying for the Lord who died for us. I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, he says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. God is a righteous God and he has a right to demand our worship. Now, He wants us to serve Him and praise Him and worship Him because we love Him, because we want to, not because we have to. Psalm 37, verse 37. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright. One of the pastors that I worked with years ago and now have the opportunity, praise the Lord, to work with again, is Pastor Mark. And here the verse says, Mark the perfect man. Well, I know Mark, and I love Mark, but I want you to know that Mark is not a perfect man. (laughs) Okay, so he's saying here, though, Mark the perfect man. That is, give attention to that man that's going after righteousness. That's really what it's talking about. But you guys know my nature. I just can't help it when I see an expression like this in the Bible. I just have to have a little good, sanctified fun with it. Mark the perfect man. Behold the upright. For the end of that man is peace. Here's someone who follows after the Lord. Even with all the blunders and mistakes that we make, we can run after righteousness. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. This is judgment. This is what happens. A lot of it actually is just plain old sowing and reaping. What a man sows, that shall he also reap. The book of the Revelation talks to us about the white throne judgment. This is something that a lot of people perhaps don't like to think about. Maybe they think it's unpleasant. But it's something that will take place. It's something that we need to talk about. The white throne judgment is that awful time when the wicked dead will stand before God and be judged for the works that they have done in this life. 
And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. This is not coming before that pleasant God that we talked about in his love and his mercy. This is having to stand before that mean God. He's not a mean God, but that's how he's perceived. David said, With the merciful you will show yourself merciful. With the pure you will show yourself pure. But with the froward, those who are hard to get along with and mean, that's how God will be presented, will be perceived by them. God has to deal with us on the basis that we deal with each other. God has to deal with us the way that we allow Him to sometimes. If God is perceived to be a mean old God, then that's because the way that we deal with people in this life. Jesus said, "In as much as you have done it or have not done it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it or not done it to me. And John the Apostle said, How can we say that we love God whom we have not seen, yet we don't love our brother who we have seen? This commandment have we from him that he who loves God will love his brother also. This is this awful judgment at the end when the wicked dead stand before God and they want to get away, but they can't. There's no place found for them. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Hell is not some figment of someone's imagination. This is that second death. The first death is when you lay down and die in this body in this life. The second death is when that lost soul dies, as it were, spiritually. It already did spiritually, but the second death is when death and hell and everything is cast into the lake of fire. They're judged out of the books that contain their works. Every evil thing they've done, God shows it to them. I don't know that He will show everything to them, but He certainly will show it to them. He has it there if He needs to show it to them. It says they were judged according to their works. And then the book of life, which is the main book, that shows whose name is in there. And everybody at that white throne judgment, their name will not be in the book. But he will show them your name is not in this book, and that's why you're being cast into the lake of fire. The good news is you don't have to go there. You can be saved and come to Christ now. Revelation twenty two twelve and Behold, I come quickly. This is Jesus talking. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This is Jesus. He is the first, the last, the Alpha, the Omega, and everything in between. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Those are the ones who have been saved by the grace of God. For without, on the outside, those who don't make it, those who decide not to serve God, they do not put their faith and trust in Christ. They're outside of that city, or dogs. These are not the four-legged dogs. These are the two-legged dogs that despise God and go against His Word. Dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. People say, well, we just don't hear no talking about the book of the Revelation. They must not be listening to Tony Broom Ministries blog and podcast because we talk about the book of the Revelation. And there are other peoples in churches that are preaching the full gospel of Christ. They talk about the book of the Revelation and things that are happening right now that are setting up the stage 
for the end of the age and things that are coming. We're setting up the stage right now, brothers and sisters, for the tribulation period and the rapture, the next great thing to take place on God's calendar. This is being set up. The stage is being set up for it right now. And we need to be ready because Jesus could come at any moment. In fact, he says here, I am the root and the offspring of David. Not only the root, but the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. He is a God of righteousness and he is a God of judgment if he needs to be. And then you ask, well, why does a loving God judge? Deuteronomy 32, 4 again. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. You cannot put blame on God. None of this mess has happened. From the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, when man partook of the tree that God told him not to do. That is our fault. It's not God's fault. Psalm 7, verse 10. My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. I know that God loves a sinner. Thank God I was a sinner and He loved me. And I ain't no sinner no more. To tear the kings ain't English up. But God loved me anyway. And now, I used to be a sinner, but now I'm a saint. I used to be lost, but now I'm saved. I used to be in sin, but now I'm born again. Praise His holy name. God judges the righteous. If God judges the righteous, no wonder it says He's angry with the wicked every day. Every day, as it were, God goes out and He seeks to save the lost. And He's angry because He says to the wicked, Why can't you see your wickedness? Why don't you listen to me? Why don't you change your ways and turn around? Why don't you come to me and let me save you? Matthew chapter 13 verse 40 as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire so shall it be in the end of this world when it says world it's talking about ionos the age the end of this age this is how it's going to be at the end of this age the son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend now this is not the rapture. This takes place at the end. The end in the millennial reign, the kingdom. He will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. When the rapture takes place, he will gather us out of the things that offend. All this world, all the offense, all the sin, he will gather us out of the world. When this event takes place, he will gather all things that offend out of the kingdom. And then, which do iniquity, those who do iniquity, he will gather those out and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Again, hell is a real place. And we need to get right with God. Don't treat it like it's a fairy tale or fiction. It's not. It's a real place. The fire is burning forever and ever. Those who refuse to know and serve God then shall the righteous shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And he's talking to us. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. God is a holy God. Before he's anything, he's holy. And we are to follow peace with all men. That's why we're no trouble to law enforcement. They don't have to worry with us. They need to protect us. They need to watch over us and make sure that we're safe. But as far as having to deal with us, they don't because we're on their side. We don't believe in defunding. We believe in refunding the police. That is, do what's right, stay out of trouble, and they won't have to spend expenses on you because you're doing what's right. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man will see the Lord. No man will see God without holiness. And it's not talking about holiness denomination. Because there's a lot of things in the holiness denomination now that's not so holy. 
And that's certainly not what God is talking about, some movement. He ain't talking about some movement. Because a movement can move closer to God and also can move away from God. He's not talking about some movement. He's talking about the state of the heart, the holiness that God gives you. You cannot earn by yourself your own merit. You cannot even earn by having man-made religious points. That holiness comes from God. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Our scripture ends with the word repentance because that is the way that you get from a God of judgment to a God of love. God's love and judgment. He is a God of judgment. He's like your parents. He'll whip you if he has to. And he'll judge you if he needs to. But he would rather show you his love. And God loves you whether you ever serve him or not. But you cannot enjoy His love like He wants you to until you come to Jesus Christ, receive Him as your Savior, and make Him your Lord. Father in heaven, I give praise to you today because you're a God of love. You're also a God of judgment. And help us as your ministers to present the whole counsel of God's Word that your people can understand that you are a God of love, but you're also a God of judgment. Help us not to hold back anything that would be profitable to God's people, but to show all the counsel of God's Word, to faithfully present, teach, and preach the whole counsel of your Word. Lord, I bestow this prayer upon my brothers and sisters in Christ today, and I pray for those who have not made Jesus Christ their Savior and Lord. I pray right now that you would give them the grace and the mercy that they need, help them to have the wisdom and Help them to have the strength that they need to open their heart and their mouth and just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I receive you as my Savior and I make you my Lord. If you do that, my friend, he will save you forever. Father, I pray a seal upon this prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God's Love and Judgment has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.